Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to worship today. Uh, we, we're going to read from Isaiah chapter 11. Uh, but before we do that, uh, let's uh, pray together. Lord God, uh, we just come to you, Lord, this morning. Uh, we thank you uh, for this uh, new day. We thank you, Lord, that we can uh, gather together uh, online to worship you. Uh, Lord, I pray, Lord, that you will uh, bless us this morning as we sing, as we open up your word together, uh, and as we uh, as we just share fellowship uh, with you uh, in this way. Lord, we pray, Lord, that the technology will continue to work for us. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that up to this point we've only had minor uh, difficulties uh, some weeks, uh, Lord, and we, 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 just, we just pray, uh, Lord, that uh, we will continue to uh, be blessed uh, through the medium of technology, uh, Lord, in these days. Lord, I pray uh, for each uh, member of the church, Lord, uh, wherever they are watching uh, just now, Lord, we, we just pray, Lord, that you will uh, come to them, Lord, that you will uh, encourage their hearts, Lord, this day. Lord, we ask this in your name. Amen. Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1. To five. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what he, what his eyes see, or decide disputes by what his ears hear. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor, and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall strike the earth with a rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist, and faithfulness shall be of his lines. So this morning as uh, we come to worship, as we as we read uh, there, uh, Isaiah was giving uh, the people uh, of his day a look to what God is going to do. He, he's giving them hope they're living in, in, in desperate times and he's saying, look what God is going to do. This is a hope that you have. Of course, we, we're looking back on this uh, from a point of history rather than the future. So we know who he's talking about. We know he's talking about Jesus. Uh, and so this morning we, we worship that root of Jesse. Uh, Jesus, our Lord and our Saviour, the righteous one, the one who judges in righteousness. And we recognise that he judges us in righteousness as well as uh, the whole earth. But for those of us who are in Christ Jesus, we're told elsewhere in Scripture that we are declared righteous because of his righteousness. So this morning as we come to worship, let us worship the one who is righteous. Let us acknowledge that he has called us to be his, to be transformed into his likeness, which we will look at later on. And as we were reminded last week, and let us too fear the Lord. Let us too have a knowledge of the Lord. Let us too seek his wisdom and understanding and let us delight in him this day. We're going to sing together in worship just now as we sing How Great Thou Art.
Thank you uh, for singing with us. Uh, we're going to uh, turn to Romans chapter 8 uh, just now. Romans chapter 8 and starting at verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, 
how will he not also be with, sorry how will he not also be with with him gl graciously give us all things who shall bring any charge against God's elect it is God who justifies who is it to con who is to condemn Jesus Christ is the one who died more than that who was raised who is at the right hand of God who indeed is interceding for us who shall separate us from the love of Christ shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword as it is written for your sake we are being killed all the day long we are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered no in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us for i am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Shall we pray? Lord God, uh, we just thank you uh, for these words, Lord, that we've been able to read this morning. Uh, Lord, I pray, Lord, that as we look at them, as we, as we think about them, as we meditate on them, uh, Lord, today and th throughout this week, Lord, Lord, that you will be illuminating its meaning to our hearts and our minds, Lord, that you will encourage us, Lord, that you will strengthen us, Lord, that you will help us to understand, Lord, that you will give us the wisdom and discernment, Lord, that we need for this day. And Lord, that uh, through what you're doing in our lives through these words, Lord, that we will shine a light for you in this part of the world that you have called us to be, Lord, that you have placed us, Lord, that you've given us a task to do for you, to bring people to you, Lord, so that they can come and be changed and renewed and transformed into your likeness as you are transforming us into your likeness. Lord, we ask this in and through your name. Amen. So this morning we come to the end of our mini-series in Romans 8. And, and well, we've been concentrating on this, this idea of the hope that we have in Christ Jesus. Uh, and we've been looking at that in light of what we're reading in, in Romans 8. And we're going to continue looking at that hope and uh, throughout uh, these next few months, really, uh, as we look at different portions of Scripture and looking at what it means to live out of the hope that we have in Christ Jesus. Uh, as I've said a few times recently, as, as I look at uh, the world around us, as I look uh, at particularly Christians in this world, there's one thing that really concerns me is the fact that we, we seem to have forgotten that in Christ Jesus we have everything we need. Uh, and the hope that we have in him is a hope for now and eternity. And we seem to have forgotten that. So, so that, that's why we're, we're, we're looking at, at this. We're, we're trying to encourage each other. We're trying to uh, build each other up. So that we are strong enough to stand with Christ in these days. And, and as we look at this passage today, uh, one thing I think we, we, we need to say right at the very beginning is that we cannot divorce it from what we've already read, what we've already looked at over these last couple of weeks. And in fact, our first, the first, very first verse, the first start of uh, verse 31, it says, what shall we say? To these things. In other words, Paul is reminding us everything I've just written about, in fact, from verse 1 of chapter 1, right the way through to this point of chapter 8, verse 31. Everything I've written about, what can we say about this? 
What does this mean? And so, so we, we're going to look at that uh, uh, this morning. For those in the church who have received uh, our um, resource pack that we, we sent out at the beginning of uh, this series, if, if you've been following along in that, and I would encourage you to do so uh, each day as you come and you meditate on these verses, uh, to, to really delve into, to really go deep, I'd encourage you to do that. Uh, and we're going to continue doing that uh, over these next few weeks as well. Uh, as, as we uh, introduce new series and things like that. Uh, the questions for this week that, that we, we ask you to think about as you are reading uh, this passage, and, and we're going to try and answer some of them this morning. Uh, the first one was, how is God for us? Uh, and we read that there, don't we, in verse 31. If, if God is for us, uh, if God is for us, so, so how, how is God for us? What, how does this bring us confidence? How does knowing that God is for us bring us confidence? What does that confidence look like? We, we, we'll look at that uh, this morning. The second part is what can separate us from the love of God? What can separate us from the love of God? How are we more than conquerors? And then a two-part, how do we conquer? So how are we more than conquerors, but how do we actually conquer? And then what is our victory? And the, those three questions really go together. Uh, so how, how is God for us? If, if, you were to, if someone was to come to you and, and ask you that question, how do you know that God is for you? What would your answer be? And, and, and for each of us, depending on our life situation, depending on the circumstances in which we're currently living through, it might depend how we might determine how we may actually answer that question. Paul has actually answered uh, this uh, question for us, and, and he actually answers it in verse 32, but he's also answered it in chapters 1 through to verse 30 of chapter eight as well uh, and the very f first thing that that we know that God is for us he said is in verse 32 where we read these words he did not spare his own son but gave him up for us he did not spare his son but gave him up for us In other words, what Paul is reminding us is that we know that God, the Father, God in his fullness, the Trinity, is for us because he gave his Son. So that, therefore, uh, we remember Paul is talking to Christians, Paul is talking to those who are in Christ Jesus. He says, you, you have been set apart for God because you were in Christ Jesus. And we know that God is for us. Despite what's going on in the world, despite the mess that is around us, we know that God is for us because he sent his son. Because while we were still sinners, he sent his son to die for us. While we were still in rebellion against God, God made it possible for, for us to be reconciled to him. He made it possible for us to be made righteous in Christ Jesus. He made it possible for us to live in relationship with him, to be a new creation, because he did not spare his son. So how do we know God is for us? Well, the first thing that we, part of our answer is that God gave his son for us. And because God gave his son, we know that in verse one of chapter uh, eight there is no condemnation yes we were in that sin yes we were subject to the to the penalty of sin which was death but because we now live in Christ Jesus we now have no condemnation we are righteous before God not because of who we are not because of what we do not because we keep a set of rules 
but because we are in Christ Jesus. And we are told to rest in that, to, to, to allow God to work for us rather than against us. And in verse 34, he, he, he says that, doesn't he? So sorry, verse uh, 28, sorry, of uh, chapter 8. And we know that for those who love God, that's those who are in Christ Jesus, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. We, we looked at that last week. That's not that everything in this world will be perfect. It's not that uh, we will get everything that we want. That's not what Paul is saying. He's saying that God, even in difficult situations, God is still working for our good. God will use what's going on in our life. God will use what we have and he will use it to, for his purpose in our lives. In other words, and we were reminded that his purpose is to transform us to the likeness of Jesus. And so, so, how do we know God is for us? Well, he gave us his son, but he's also working for us. So that we will be transformed into the likeness of his son. So that we will be his light, his salt in this world. He goes on to talk about in verse 34. Again, this idea that there's no condemnation. He says, who is to condemn? Jesus Christ is the one who died. So he's reminding us that because Jesus died, because Jesus was the perfect sacrifice, that we don't stand condemned. No one can condemn us because we are in Christ Jesus, who has paid the penalty for our sin. So therefore nothing in this world, nothing in our own lives, nothing uh, that go is going on around us, Satan himself, uh, nothing, no one can stand and condemn us. Why? Because Jesus has declared us, God sorry, has declared us righteous because of the blood of Jesus. And he said this is for everyone who is God's elect. In other words, those who are in Christ Jesus, those who we read last week, didn't we? At the end of uh, verse uh, thirty-nine and uh, sorry, twenty-nine and thirty, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. Remember, we're being predestined to be conformed uh, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. That's Jesus who would be the firstborn. And those whom he predestined, he also called, and those whom he called, he also justified, and those who, whom he justified, he also glorified. God finishes what he starts. God selects those who are in Christ Jesus, those who God calls, and they answer his call. They are in Christ Jesus. It's God doing the work. We respond to the work that God is doing. Continuing in verse 34, we read that the Son not only died for us, but is interceding for us at the right hand of God. The Holy Spirit, remember, is interceding for us in our own hearts. He's the one working in our hearts. Jesus is at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us there. So the, we got two persons of the Trinity praying for us, interceding for us, pleading for us to the Father who loves us and wants to give us everything that is in Christ Jesus. The Trinity working together for us. And this is so that we can be conformed into the image of the Son. How do we know that God is for us? Because he's transforming us into the image of his Son who died for us, who he did not withhold from us. 
so that we could be declared righteous in his sight. If God is for us, who can stand against us? Well, the obvious answer, Paul has given us no other possibility. But the obvious answer is no one. No one can stand against us because the God of the universe, the God who created all of this, is for us. And he's gone to great lengths to, to prove it. He's gone to great lengths to restore us and to conform us into the image of his son and to restore the relationship that he desires with us. To lavish love upon us. If he is for us, and no one is bigger than God, no one is more powerful than God, no, more is, no one is more greater than God, then who could possibly stand against us? How does this give us confidence? As I said, we're with God for us, no one can stand against us, not even an empire. Remember, Paul was living in the midst of the height of the Roman Empire. They were powerful. They were they were the rulers of the world in his day and what they said went they couldn't stand against Paul Paul wasn't afraid of them even though it meant his certain death he says because God is for me they can do their worst to me and it will not break me it will not destroy me because I know who I am in Christ Jesus. He, Jesus himself, knowing that God is for me, gives me such great confidence to, to stand against the evil of my day, to stand against individuals of my day, to stand against religious oppression of my day. Those who think they know Jesus think they know God, think they know the right theology. But actually their lies are against God. And we, we, we're seeing it in the news in, in these days, people who, were, who claim to know Jesus, and yet their lives are not stacking. It says they can't stand against you. It, 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 knowing that God is for you should give you confidence to stand for the truth. In your day. In grace, yes, but stand for the truth. We, we don't need to compromise in any area because God is for us. And knowing that God is for us should give us confidence to stand even against empires, even against religious institutions that are going against God. It gives us confidence because we know that we have, we have freedom to be who God has intended us to be. We have a freedom from condemnation. In other words, that we have a free conscience before God because we know the penalty has been paid. That's not to say we're going to get everything right. It's not going to say. It's not to say that when when we do make mistakes that we need to come to God and we need to confess it. Of course we do. And when, when, when we've made a mistake, we, we need to repent, both privately, and if we're living our lives in the public sphere, we need to repent publicly as well. It gives us confidence because we have new life. We're told that in Christ Jesus we have new life. We, we have died with Christ, and so therefore we are raised to new life in him. This is an assurance of salvation. This is what Paul is writing in chapter 8. It is, an, it is to give us an assurance of the salvation we have in Jesus so that we can stand boldly for him in the here and now because we know he's going to stand boldly for us on the day of judgment. What more could give us confidence knowing that God is for us, knowing that uh, on the day of judgment, Jesus is going to stand boldly for us because he died for us and he has raised us to new life in him. 
so that we can stand boldly for him now. So what can separate us from the love of God? Well, if, if empires can't, if, if the world around us, religious institutions can't stand against us, what can separate us from the love of God? Well, well it seems to me that as, as Paul is arguing uh, his case here, he, he's thinking, uh, as he often does, he, he, he tries to play uh, um, devil's advocate, if, if, if you like. Uh, he tries to say, well, what other objections could there possibly be? Well, if all this outside of me can't do anything, what about me? Can I do anything that separates me from God? If I'm in Christ Jesus. And again, as, as we read verse 35 onwards, the, the short answer is nothing can separate us from the love of God. Uh, and he goes on to to really unpack this for us. Verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Because well, when I say the love of God, uh, I'm talking about the, the full Trinity. And so, so, so if we are in Christ Jesus, what can separate us from being in Christ Jesus? So that's really what Paul is saying here about the love of Christ. And he, he gives some options. He says, shall tribulation... Or distress you know you got to remember that uh, Paul is writing at a time uh, when the Christians are starting to experience severe persecution even more so than the persecution he unleashed on the church in, in its very early days even more powerful than that because it's, it's starting to come from the Empire not just a band of rebels in uh, a band of uh, Pharisees, sorry, in, <coughs> in Judaism. But the empire itself. He says, it's a tribulation or distress. Or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword. He says, everything this world could possibly throw at us. Can that separate us from the love of God? No, because remember God is for you. You're in Christ Jesus. Not, you cannot be pulled out of that by anything or anyone. As it is written, he says, uh, for your sake we are being killed. In other words, this is because they're standing for God that they're, they're suffering these things. He says, no, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And he answers, for I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So what what does this mean? He's, he's, he's giving us a few a few categories if, if you like and he's, he's, he's trying to cover every category that we could possibly think of that might separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. He says spiritual forces cannot separate us. He says everything in this world cannot separate us. He said even if we're being persecuted, even if we're being murdered, even if we're being downtrodden and we're being denied employment because of Jesus. Because we're in Christ Jesus. None of that can separate us from the love of God. In Christ Jesus. He says, in fact, even you yourself cannot separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. That's a pretty big claim that Paul is making. He says, if you are in Christ Jesus, nothing, nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. The only thing that can separate you from God is if you reject God. In other words, we say Jesus' death, Jesus' sacrifice on the cross isn't enough for me. I can do it. I can actually do better myself. 
I don't want to, the righteousness of Christ. I want my own righteousness. That is the only thing that can separate us from God. Is a rejection of God. You see, because the key is to be in Christ Jesus. To rest in his finished work on the cross. To be in Christ Jesus means to believe in him. To confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord. But to trust in him as well. See, believing on its own is not enough. Peter says even the demons believe in Jesus. But they don't trust him. They don't worship him. They, they don't surrender to him. So trust. Do you trust that Jesus is enough to cover your sin? Do you believe that Jesus is enough to declare you righteous? Do you believe that Jesus is enough when everything around you is crumbling? That, there's, that you don't have enough food on the table? Do you trust that Jesus is enough? Do you trust that Jesus is enough? When you're still looking for work. Do you believe? Do you rest in his finished work on the cross? Because for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. Those of us who are being transformed into the likeness of his son. That's what it means to be in Christ Jesus. And we're told that if we are in Christ Jesus. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. And that God loves us so much that he's working for us. Even in trials and tribulations. Even in the sufferings of this world. Whether it's health, whether it's economic, whatever the problem is. That God is working for us. To transform us into the likeness of his son. And I'm reminded in, in John's Gospel where Jesus is talking, he's, he's trying to encourage the disciples. He's about to finish the work on the cross. He's about to go to the cross and finish the work that he came to do. And he says, if you, if you abide in me, if you stay in me, I will abide in you. And that will be enough. You will do Great things for me in this world. Not be great, but do great things for the kingdom of God. If you abide in me, I am enough. Do you trust that? And when we trust that, when we rest in that, when we have confidence in that, Paul goes on to say, I am convinced that we are more than conquerors through him who loved us in verse 37. We are more than conquerors. Um, some commentators say uh, the literal translation is super conquerors. Uh, in other words, an almost super, super uh, hero like Conquerors. Uh, Warren Wiersbe in, in his commentary uh, uh, says this, and I'm going to quote him directly here this morning. Uh, he says in Romans 8, chapter, uh, verse 31 to 34, Paul proved that God cannot fail us because God is faithful and God always finishes what he um, what he. That has started and if he started the work in us he will bring it to completion Paul says in Philippians uh, going back to Wiersbe's uh, commentary he says in in Romans chapter 8 verse 31 to 34 Paul proved that God cannot fail us but it, but is it possible that we can fail him we're coming back to our our own sin uh, and the mistakes that we make even when we're in Christ Jesus we're not perfect yet uh, 
Suppose some great trial or tribulation comes and we fail, Robin Rinsby says. Then what? What happens when we fail? We make a mistake. We sin. Paul deals with that problem in this final section and explains that nothing can separate us from the love of God. To begin with, God does not shelter us from the difficulties of life because we need them for our spiritual growth. And God assures us that the difficulties of life are working for us and not against us. God has permitted trials to come that we might use them for our good and his glory. We endure trials for his sake. And since we do, do you think that he'll desert us? Of course not. Instead, he is closer to us when we go through the difficulties of life. Furthermore, he gives us the power to conquer. We are more than conquerors. Literally, we are super conquerors through Jesus Christ. He gives us victory and more victory and more victory. Therefore, we need not fear. So how are we more than conquerors? What is our victory? Well, we conquer if we put all of this together, what Paul has been saying in the whole of chapter 8 and, and up to this point as well, in, in verses chapters 1 to 7, uh, through, through chapter 8, when we put all of that together, we conquer through trusting God in all things. We conquer through abiding in the finished work of Christ on the cross. And when we don't, and when we don't, we can often feel defeated. We can often feel like this is too heavy for us to carry. And I think that's actually the point. It is too heavy for us to carry. That's why Jesus says, come to me. All you who are weary, all you who are heavy laden. All you who have too many burdens to bear. Come to me, let me carry it. Let me take the weight of it because my yoke is easy and light. When we don't trust God, we often feel defeated. But when we do trust God, we're told that we will conquer. We will conquer that temptation. We will conquer uh, the pain that we're going through right now. That this is momentary, it is temporary. And we will conquer it. In other words, we will conquer eternally. Not just the here and now, but eternally. We will stand on the day of judgment and not be condemned. In other words, we have conquered sin and we have conquered death through the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because we're trusting in him, in his finished work. We are conquerors. We're told we, uh, we conquer sin and death. Now that's not physical death necessarily unless Jesus comes back and uh, uh, before we physically die. Otherwise we will physically die. But we won't suffer eternal death. We will gain eternal life. So when we say we conquer sin and death, that's what we're meaning. So the victory is victory is the victory of Christ. The victory of Christ over sin, the victory of Christ over death. And we will live with him in eternity. We will live with him in eternity. And we have confidence in this because of what Christ has done 
on the cross. And that he was raised to life and now sits at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us. Saying, have you seen they're mine? They belong to me. Do you see their righteousness that I have clothed them in? The hope that we have in Christ Jesus, this is it. This is the hope that we have. A hope that is not fully yet realised, but God has promised will, be, will come to pass. And because God has promised it, we can trust it, we can live in it now. We can declare the victory now. Don't let the world tell you that God doesn't love you. Don't let your own shortcomings tell you that God doesn't love you. Don't let Satan tell you that God does not love you. Because in Christ Jesus, God loves you and he's transforming you and he's working all things for your good. And if you're not in Christ Jesus yet, hear the call of God and respond to him. Die to self and be raised to life in Christ Jesus. So this will be your hope. This will be your experience as it is ours in Christ Jesus. So in conclusion uh, this morning. Again, uh, Warren Wilsby says this and I thought it was a great conclusion to this chapter. I thought it was a great conclusion to this series that we've just had as we've looked at this chapter. And so I just share his words uh, with you. A review of this wonderful chapter shows that the Christian is completely victorious. We are free from judgment because Christ died for us and we have his righteousness. We, we are free from defeat sorry, because Christ lives in us by his spirit and we share his life. We are free from discouragement because Christ is coming for us and we shall share his glory. And we are free from fear because Christ intercedes for us and we cannot be separated from his love. And I finish with this question. A question from Paul in scripture. If God is for us, who can be against us? Amen. Shall we pray? Lord God, we uh, come to you this morning. We thank you for that reminder, Lord, that we are more than conquerors in you. Lord, that nothing in this world can separate us. Nothing in the spiritual realms can separate us. Nothing even in ourselves can separate us from you. When you have called us and redeemed us through Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you and we praise you for that this morning. We thank you, Lord, that you have called us to victorious living. Lord, help us to remember that. Help us to live in that. Help us to abide in you, to rest and to trust you in all things. So, Lord, that whether famine or sword, whether uh, persecutions, whether uh, tribulations, whether distress, whatever it is, Lord, disease, it doesn't matter. Or whatever it is, whether they come against us, or that we will stand firm with you, resting in you, not fearing this life, but rejoicing in the next. Lord, we ask this in your name. Amen. We're going to sing together before we share the announcements and the benediction together. We're going to sing, Yet Not I, But Christ. Gift of grace, if Jesus my
thank you uh, very much uh, for singing with us there. Uh, just a few announcements uh, for us this morning. First announcement is that we will have our coffee and chat on Zoom uh, after this, uh, after we've uh, stopped streaming uh, this morning. Uh, so, so join us uh, there. And the uh, meeting ID and password is right there for you. This coming Tuesday, uh, the 16th of February, we'll have our Bible study uh, at 8 o'clock on Zoom. Again, the meeting ID and password is right there. Uh, we're studying uh, John's Gospel still. Where we're still in chapter 6 and we're going to look at verse uh, 22 to 59. Next Sunday, the 21st of February, we will uh, be meeting again at 10.30 on YouTube and Facebook uh, for our worship together. And then a week on Tuesday, Tuesday the 23rd of February, 8 o'clock on Zoom. Again, meeting ID and password is there. We're going to have a games and quiz night. Uh, so uh, join us uh, for that to be a great opportunity just to come together and have a bit of fun together as well and, and to just to enjoy uh, some fellowship together in that. Uh, bring your own refreshments obviously uh, as we're meeting online but the entertainment will be provided uh, for you. Uh, that's our uh, announcements uh, for this morning. Uh, please uh, continue uh, to study uh, what we've been looking at uh, this morning in Romans chapter 8 as, uh, as you go through this week uh, as well, uh, just uh, to be encouraged uh, by them and, and to look a bit more deeply what we've talked about this morning. Uh, ask God to just reveal uh, those truths uh, to you. Going to read uh, from Matthew's Gospel chapter 28 uh, for our benediction. Uh, this morning and sat at verse 18 and Jesus came and said to them all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you and behold I am with you always to the end of the age. Thank you very much. Goodbye and God bless. <laughs>